Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, Tuskegee Harvard uh, Medical School Center for Bioethics uh, uh, webinar. Title you see there, Tuskegee Healing, the Moral Determinants of Health and the Ethics of Research on Black Health. Next. Um, uh, I'm just going to go over some introductory things, uh, and then we'll go from there. So uh, we really, really want, we need this to be as participatory, interactive as possible. Um, so you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature. Um, also uh, put things in the chat. I'm going to be putting things in the chat, including uh, when I stop talking here, uh, a link to a copy of all the slides. Um, uh, uh, so you have those. Uh, we also really hope that uh, this webinar will spark all of us to be thinking and staying in touch and continuing the conversation, asking questions in social media, whether that for you is Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or some other ways. Uh, but to keep the conversation united, we really want you to use uh, the uh, hashtags Tuskegee Healing, Moral Determinants, and HMS Bioethics, or add your own if you want that to try to catch on. Uh, uh, this will be is being recorded and will be available on the Center for Bioethics YouTube channel um, uh, sometime next week. When that happens, we'll be emailing all of you so that you have the link you can share with other people. Um, and when we send you the email about that, uh, there are going to be questions that you've asked that we didn't have time to answer. And to the extent we can, uh, we'll uh, include something about those questions there. If you have any technical issues, use the chat feature to send a message. Um, uh, and then please subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter if you're interested in this. Next slide. These are upcoming consortia. The uh, Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School has regularly, almost weekly consortia. Uh, and uh, you can also go to our, uh, just Google a a HMS Center for Bioethics YouTube channel. Almost all of these are recorded and you can see the videos online. Next. All right, I'm going to take uh, be as brief as I can, uh, but it'll probably take me about the next 10 minutes or so just to uh, uh, offer you some framing kinds of themes about how to think about some of the issues we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to go through these much faster uh, than we'll give you time to digest them, which is why I'm going to put the link in the slides uh, afterwards. Um, uh, I'm starting with this, uh, not just because this entire webinar um, is really uh, uh, driven by, uh, inspired by, um, uh, enhanced by the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University, and particularly the descendants um, uh, of the 623 men in the study, um, who a number of years ago organized themselves into just an extraordinary organization, Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation. You'll be hearing from uh, uh, two of the people uh, deeply involved in that, one on video and one here. But the symbol here I've shown you of the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare uh, at Tuskegee, I had never known about before, but our colleagues, friends there explained to me, uh, at the center of that is uh, the Sankofa bird. Now the Sankofa bird um, is a mythical bird uh, 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 from uh, years long, long ago in Ghana. Um, I used to think that uh, mythical meant not real. Um, and the Sankofa bird isn't real in the sense that you'll see one flying around, but it is, has been for uh, 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 generations in Ghana uh, and uh, for the National Center in Tuskegee. And I would say now for me, uh, one of the most powerfully real things in my life. Um, uh, uh, but let me explain what the Sankofa bird is. Uh, the Sankofa bird um, uh, it, this mythical bird uh, uh, shown there um, is uh, an African bird that regularly flies back, that's why the head's looking backwards, flies back into the past to our ancestors and what they lived with, what their lives were like, fly, goes back into the past, sees with crystal clear vision what that past was, and some of the things are painful. But some of the things are inspiring, no matter where the Sankofa bird uh, flies. Uh, the Sankofa bird sees uh, what's uh, in the beak there, you can see uh, uh, a golden egg. There it's a black egg. Um, 
And the St. Copa bird goes back and fetches, is the word they use, that egg from the past and brings it into the present. And that egg, that treasure from the past, helps the St. Copa bird in the present and fly and bring the best of the past into the future. Um, so uh, uh, even though this is a mythical bird, uh, I think that idea, and you'll hear me refer to it through the rest of uh, my introduction, um, uh, is a real and very powerful metaphor, um, including what the Sankofa bird has brought us from the past into the present is an egg, um, which really is just a seed. It isn't something more than that until we fertilize that, we nurture it, we help it grow. It's just bringing us uh, uh, eggs or uh, crystals or other things from the past, and it's up to us to carry them forward. So next slide. Uh, uh, looking back in the recent past, this webinar is really the fourth in a series just in the last few months of important conferences, uh, all of which uh, have originated from or with Tuskegee, um, and all of which were uh, fully planned with descendants or centrally involved descendants. Uh, uh, October 31st and November 3rd, uh, several days from the National Center, the moral determinants of health, what do we do with what we know? That's the moral question. We know things, the moral question is what do we do? Um, that's a question that came to us from Mrs. Lilyhead and the descendants. Uh, that uh, the, that conference focused on four concrete topics, HIV, AIDS, COVID, maternal mortality, gun violence. So we're carrying those topics on. Just a few weeks later, um, uh, Dr. Termika Smith, who's with us and lots of colleagues at CDC coordinating with the descendants had a wonderful two and a half hour webinar conference at CDC headquarters in Atlanta. I'm gonna put the link in the chat to that and we're gonna show a couple of brief ex excerpts. Um, just uh, last week uh, in Macon County in Tuskegee, the descendants, the people of Macon County and leading researchers got together uh, for another conference. So this is the fourth in a series we're carrying that forward. Next slide. So I'm gonna uh, step way, way back uh, since uh, we're uh, doing this from the to the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee and the Center for Bioethics at Harvard and ask as uh, fundamental, radical, radical literally means at the roots um, questions, like what even is bioethics? And the words just mean bio means life, ethics is about values. Uh, uh, so what might ethics actually apply to? Um, and what I really believe is that ethic, everything is or should be an ethics issue. For anything we, we do, I was taught this by Dr. Mitchell Rabkin, longtime head of my hospital. Um, uh, he'd say, for everything we're doing from time to time, we should ask, why are we doing that? Why is it important? Why does it matter? And then you'll come up with an answer. Oh, we need to balance the budget, or we need to do X or Y. And then he says, that's not the answer. Why is that important? And then you have another, why is that important? And you don't get to the real reason for anything we are doing or think about doing until you arrive at a value. Because our patients' lives matter. Because and, and so everything needs to be anchored in values, or I'd say it's not really a human moral uh, uh, endeavor. And then I think everything is a bioethics issue because anything any of us value matters to us because it matters to our life, someone else's life. So I think everything is a bioethics issue. Next slide. In all of this, all I'm going to say is words, the words we use, that's how we communicate, uh, 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 at least in written form, we communicate lots of other ways, um, including through images and music and uh, 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 physical ways, but words really, really matter. So we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the word Tuskegee and these other words. So just one example I had, we've been talking for years about the social determinants of health. Um, the editor of Health Affairs, one of the most important health journals in the country, had an editorial last year that said, we should be talking about the social determinants of death. Words can really matter. Next slide. 
So the word Tuskegee, when I was growing up, I didn't know a lot about Tuskegee. I'm like this white kid growing up in the Northeast, but I knew some about Tuskegee. I heard about Tuskegee. I knew what that was. Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, this great scientist. Uh, uh, I didn't at the time know about the Tuskegee Airmen, but uh, uh, up until uh, the summer of 1972, everyone in this country who knew the word Tuskegee knew that it meant black excellence. And then in the summer of 1972, front page story all over about the United States Public Health Service uh, uh, study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. And for the uh, uh, 50 years since then, most people, when they hear the word Tuskegee, if they don't really understand the history or what's on that campus today, the first word that comes to mind is a disease. Th that needs to change. And what we're hoping to do, the descendants are really urging us to do is do work so that we have re-earned, all of us, um, uh, the right to uh, just uh, uh, think of Tuskegee as excellence and healing. And we're gonna work on that today. Next. Moral determinants of health. All I'm gonna say here is, we hear a lot about uh, most health resulting from the social determinants of health. Daniel Dawes uh, has written a book and taught us a lot that those social determinants, uh, housing, transportation, education, poverty, all of those things really are the results. They're determined by the political determinants of health. And uh, what we started uh, with the National Center in November with that conference on the moral determinants of health is to say, well, actually, if you get down to the deepest level, it's all about the moral determinants of health. But as Kamara Phyllis Jones, my most important teacher about racism says, the single most important first step about racism is name it, otherwise you can't talk about it. But then you need to actually understand what exactly is, how does it work, how does it operate? So we're just naming right now moral determinants of health, but these conversations we're having today and afterwards are like, what do we mean by those? How do they determine things? And then the moral question is, and sh what should we do about them? Next slide. Research. Research has come to mean certain things with people in white coats and other things, but all research is, is an effort by human beings to increase our understanding through science. And science is about what is, we need to understand what is currently. How did it come to be that way? That the history of what is. Ethics is about what ought to be. And then uh, once we, when we thought about, oh, what ought to be, including what ought to be true in our world? What do I, what, what ought to be true in my life in the future? Um, and then from that, and then what do I need to do if there's a gap between what ought to be and what currently is. Um, before we go to the next slide, let me just say one of the many things that I learned in Africa has me now thinking there actually is only one practical ethics question for any of us. The field of bioethics, uh, including me, has often about figuring out what the right thing is and telling other people to do it, right? Um, a proverb people at the hospital know that I've learned in Africa uh, is, uh, uh, be very careful when you're pointing your finger at someone because your hand is much smarter than you are. Three of your four fingers are pointing where you need to be focusing because, in fact, it's the only thing you have any control over. So the only question in everything you're going to hear today for all of you participating it, that you have any control over is, what are you going to do? And I'll be asking, what am I going to do? Because that's the only thing I actually have any control over and responsibility for. Next. When we think about uh, ethics uh, uh, of research, um, we think about informed consent forms and all that. But going back to one of my most important teachers in college, Paul Ramsey, who wrote a book in 1970, two years before that story about the US Public Health Service syphilis study. Um, uh, and, and what did he say about research? The most important thing he said to understand about research on human subjects is that any human being is more than a patient or an experimental subject. He, Paul Ramsey said he, 
is a personal, every bit a human being as the physician investigator, every bit of, as much a person. So research is a great human adventure that has to be always is carried forth jointly by the investigator and his, her, their subjects. Um, in some ways, I think this might not even go for, far enough, even though it's largely been lost, um, to the extent that I am an individual or a community and researchers are wanting to study something about me or with me, um, uh, those researchers are guests in my life or guests in my community. So I'm actually not sure that equal partners is the right thing, um, uh, that the patient, the person, the community is the one that's invited the researchers in. Uh, the researchers are guests. Next slide. Two facts we're going to hear um, from Jesse Mylan, the president of AIDS United, uh, about how he thinks we should think about this. But first fact, uh, uh, HIV in the United States, you see that black. Um, if, if I am a human being, a person in the United States today, and my skin color is the color of Jesse Mylan's, I am eight times as likely to get HIV as if the skin color is my skin color. If you're black in the United States, eight times as likely to get HIV. That's a fact. So what do we need to understand about that? Why it's that way and do about that is a question for us. Next slide. The Sunday New York Times this Sunday um, had a uh, horrifying, but in some ways, most of it not news, um, uh, set of other facts. Here's just one. Um, uh, the infant mortality rate if the baby's mother is black is higher than if the baby's mother is white, even the richest black mothers have babies that die at a higher rate than the poorest white mothers. That's a fact. How are we gonna understand that? And what are we gonna do about it? Next. So uh, I have two things on this slide. One on the left, Dr. Paul Farmer, a hero to many of us, um, uh, identifies what Paul believed was the most important moral determinant of health and almost everything else. The idea that some lives matter less than others is the root of all that's wrong with the world. Do we really believe that all lives matter equally? And then I put on the right, uh, uh, an example of what one person did about this. Um, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who in the last century was one of the most admired human beings in the world, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, when he was in his 20s um, in Europe, he was studying philosophy, theology, music, all of those things. Uh, but uh, somehow he stumbled across uh, interest in Africa and read about what had happened in Africa. None of his biological relatives, as far as I can tell, had anything to do with that. But Dr. Schweitzer identified as a European, as a Christian, and as a white person. And he learned what people whose heritage he shared, he owned, unless he was going to deny that he was white, deny he was European, or deny he was Christian, had done in Africa. And he didn't think apologizing for what other people had done was enough. Um, he didn't think um, not doing that ever again in the future was enough. Um, he said he actually gave all of that up, left, went to medical school, trained as a doctor. He and his wife went to Africa, spent the rest of his life there. And he said, I went to Africa because I wanted as a white man, not I had to, not I was told to, I wanted as a white man in Europe to atone to the African for the blood and the tragedy and the suffering that the white man in Europe had perpetrated on that continent. That's what one example uh, that my San Copen bird has found in the past uh, that uh, I think we should at least be thinking about as we wonder about ourselves. Next slide. Uh, MLK um, is one of our great heroes. Uh, I'll put in the chat more information about this. Uh, 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 this past MLK Day was the dedication of a 22-foot high bronze sculpture on Boston Common um, that is now the anchor point for what is going to be uh, uh, citywide, region-wide efforts to translate the love, 
that MLK and Coretta had for each other as the source of social justice work. Next slide. So we see these quotes from MLK over and over again. You'll have these slides in the chat uh, about injustice in healthcare, about love, about the arc of the moral universe. Um, and uh, uh, these are things that my Sankofa bird has brought from the past to me. Um, just one comment on the arc of the moral universe. It's obvious it doesn't bend by itself. It has only bent when people like MLK, John Lewis, and others did some really hard bending. Next slide. Cornell West, um, I think, has succinctly said what MLK was trying to say. And the question is, uh, do we believe that? And if so, what are we going to do? The MLK weekend here culminated with an amazing standing room only uh, concert in Symphony Hall in Boston uh, with the Boston Children's Choir singing to us about what they had learned from MLK and what they were doing to become themselves more like MLK today. Um, uh, we're gonna hear at the very end, I won't do a spoiler alert uh, for a few minutes uh, from uh, uh, other young people at the very end of this. Next slide. And then do we really believe or take seriously uh, uh, these two other treasures my Sankofa birds brought to me? Um, uh, you can know the quote from MLK on the left, Rabbi Heschel um, uh, marched with MLK in Selma, and that was not an easy decision. Most of his Jewish rabbi friends pleaded with him not to go there because they knew that having uh, uh, Jewish rabbis there with the stigmatized, scorned, outcast African-Americans uh, was going to have some people hate the Jews even more. But Rabbi Heschel felt he had no choice. He felt, said in a free society, some people are guilty, but every one of us is responsible. And for him to be responsible meant he had to be there. In the MLK concert that uh, Boston Children's Choir did, uh, the kids said, the kids are amazing. They said, we know a lot of you in the audience are asking yourselves, uh, what would you have done if you had been alive with MLK, what would you have done back then in the civil rights movement? And they said, we think the answer is easy. What are you doing now? That will tell you. Next slide. We're not able to have Reverend Jeffrey Brown, the co-chair of the Embrace uh, with us. He had to be at a funeral, um, uh, so he's not joining us, uh, but I didn't want to leave out the topic of gun violence. And so the uh, 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 last thing uh, that we'll do is hear uh, uh, his uh, uh, sense of the moral determinants of gun violence in the next slide, 60 seconds uh, at the embrace. You'll see the embrace in the video. So next slide and start the video. It's another black life that has been taken from us. God, we tire of business as usual. So we stand here together, determined to reframe this narrative so that people will understand that Tyree's life matters, that our lives matter. And that as we stand together with our hands in one another, we will draw strength from each other to be able to hold our heads up high together and change this world together. Now I'm going to go to the beginning of the CDC conference uh, that uh, uh, Tamika Smith co-organized. We'll go to the next slide um, and show the first two and a half minutes, how it started. Or click on the bottom.
No, start from the very beginning. For this one, start from the very beginning. U.S. Public Health. So good afternoon, everyone. I love call and response. I'm glad you actually responded and said good afternoon. Thank you for doing that. Um, I words cannot express how excited I am to be here um, recognizing the United States Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male in Tuskegee and Macon County, Alabama, 1932 to 1972. Today will be a day of reflection, remembrance, hope, and joy. Today, I hope we not only provide answers to your questions, but we, that we also pique your curiosity and your desire to learn more, specifically on ethics and equity. To begin our program, I would like to introduce President Joseph R. Biden, the 46th President of the United States. Thank you to the CDC and all of you for recognizing the 50th anniversary of the end of a grave, grave injustice. Government doctors tricked hundreds of rural black farmers into joining the Tuskegee syphilis study, shattering trust in medicine in ways that still endure. It took a brave whistleblower to end the experiment 50 years ago, but it took another 25 years before our government apologized under President Clinton. When it did, one of the study's last survivors said, and I quote, it's never too late to work to restore faith and trust, end of quote. That's the work of America. Our history has always been a tug of war between the ideal that we're all created equal and the harsh reality that racism has long torn us apart. At our best, the American ideal wins, but to heal, we can't forget the past. On my first day as president, I signed an executive order to advance racial equity across the board to ensure the promise of America for all Americans. Over 90 federal agencies are taking over 300 actions to close the racial gap in wages, wealth, health, and so much more. And it matters. Restoring faith and trust is the work of our time. So thank you. Thank all of you for being partners in this work. Um, and a few minutes later in the next slide and segment, um, Carmen's mother, Mrs. Lily Head, uh, explained what the study was about. So we can go to that. Next slide, I think. Mrs. Head, I would like to start with you first. Can you tell us a little about those most impacted by the study, the men and their families? Thank you. And I would also like to thank Dr. Walensky, Dr. Smith, and everyone here at CDC who had a role in planning and preparing for this program. Thank you so very much. The men, they were all human beings. They were sons, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, cousins, neighbors, pillars of their community, pastors of churches, church leaders. They were our family providers. They were the rocks of our families. They were loved and they loved. They contributed to society and our country. And they were denied, deceived, lied to, regarded as less than, and treated inhumanely and used as lap guinea pigs. They were trusting believing my father along with 622 other loving men were in this study and they were human beings and they were loved thank you for that reflection powerful words
One more question for you before I let you go. Now, most of us refer to the study as the Tuskegee study. What is the true name of the study? And what, what does it mean? Tuskegee syphilis study, as it is commonly known, and Tuskegee experiment, as it is commonly known, is mis mis uh, seeing, mis uh, treating the name of the study and of the men. When you place Tuskegee in front of the study, it gives Tuskegee the ownership. It leaves a scar on the town of Tuskegee and of Macon County. Tuskegee were not, is not, the owner of that study. It is the United States Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis at Tuskegee and Macon County. That's very important. And we want to change that. That's part of moving forward. And that's part of telling the whole story. You might see Tuskegee syphilis study, but it doesn't tell you what the study was all about. When you place untreated in front of that, it tells you the deception, the deceit, and the purpose of that study from the very beginning. Untreated. So we need to be cognizant of that, and we need to tell it. There's nothing wrong, as Dr. Wilinski saying, in not allowing our past to lead us into the future or to be a part of our future. But it's important for us to realize that we must revisit our, our past in order to move forward for the future so that we don't make the same mistakes and we can improve every day in what we are doing. All right, thank you. Um, the, uh, we're gonna now move maybe in the next slide. I'm not gonna do long introductions. I've invited each speaker, uh, you have their titles to just tell us if there are additional things that they would like us to know about them. And so I'm not just gonna hand it over to Carmen Thornton. Carmen? Good afternoon, hoping everyone can hear me. Um, thank you very much for um, your intro and your very thorough um, discussion. I really appreciated learning from you this afternoon. Um, hello everyone, I'm Carmen Head Thornton. I am board member and the finance committee chair for Voices of Our Father's Legacy Foundation. I also work as the director of research grants and workforce and as Interim Director of Development at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. My career and commitment to public health is the direct result of my family's history. I am the granddaughter of Fred Tyson, one of the men used as a subject in the US Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. My grandfather played an instrumental role in my upbringing. He was born in Tuskegee, Alabama and took great pride in both his community and family as a father, husband, carpenter, farmer, and firefighter. Voices for Our Fathers is a 501c3 nonprofit established or founded in 2014. Our goal is to preserve the legacies and history of the 623 men victimized and unethically treated in the syphilis study and to foster social justice, education, and public health. My mother, you just heard from, um, Lily Tyson Head serves as the foundation's president. I extend sincere thanks on behalf of the board for including us, the families, the community in this conversation as discussants. It means so much. There's probably been thousands upon thousands of talks about the syphilis study. It's very few and far between where you see that family members are also invited to be a part of the conversation. So I sincerely thank you um, for extending this invitation as, uh, uh, to us. Um, as partners in this. Um, it is an esteemed pleasure and honor to spend part of this afternoon with the distinguished uh, speakers that are virtually gathered today, some of whom I have known and truly admired for many years. Um, 
I also take a special delight in all of those who have registered today to be part of this experience as audience members. And I'm hoping that you will find this Black history experience both informational and inspiring to your work in the fields of public health, medicine, research, and ethics. Tuskegee healing, the moral determinants of health, and the ethics of research on Black health is the title of today's discussion, which I, I absolutely love. I also acknowledge all of the students and trainees who are participating as course requirements and wish you tremendous success and Godspeed in your future work to champion health equity and conquer systemic racism as its negative and unfair impacts on health outcomes of BIPOC communities around the world. The, I truly believe that the, the, the future generation will lead us and that our youth and our, our trainees are our future. They are our greatest resource. So I, I wish you all of the luck in, in, in building your careers and doing this very important and noble work. I also give a quick shout out to um, my nieces, Kylie and Trinity and Bryce. They're in the sixth and seventh grades and they're also students um, uh, and they're, they're learning and listening in today as well. Um, I applaud Tuskegee University and Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics for this two-year partnership in creating this important plat platform to share, disseminate, and reflect on the moral and ethical lessons of the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. As a granddaughter of one of the men, I am convinced that there are still many important moral and ethical lessons to learn from the syphilis study at Tuskegee, particularly as we public health, community, medical leaders explore how to build trust and to determine how best to deconstruct medical mistrust with accountability, validation, forgiveness, and restitution leading the way. I am proud that this webinar builds um, on the three important previous uh, recent conferences that Lachlan just mentioned, um, each uh, designed to honor the memories of the 623 men in the study by engaging as many people as possible in commitments to deeply understand and to definitively end the harmful effects of racism on health and healthcare in this country. As we begin the dialogue with the discussants today, I am inspired by the quote, a quote by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which states that the time is always right to do what is right. And looking at this from a moral and ethical lens, I think that um, that quote is just so apropos. I'm looking forward to a wonderful conversation today with these uh, esteemed um, discussants. And um, I thank you for recognizing the past and uh, challenge us all to move uh, the legacy of the syphilis study from one that is really focused on trauma and tra trauma and, and tragedy to one that shines the, to one that shines the light on triumph and victory. So um, thank you again, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Carmen, and uh, 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 for all of you uh, uh, um, uh, who are participating. Uh, to share Carmen's thanks to you. Um, and after uh, the presenters and panelists and all that, we're going to return to Carmen on behalf of herself, her mother, and all the descendants for the final words. Um, uh, but right next, uh, we're going to turn to Susan Reverby. You can see her on your screen. I'll let uh, Professor Reverby, Reverby, but for today, we're family. So I'm going to say Susan, um, uh, uh, offer some thoughts. So Susan. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really um, glad to be here. Um, I'm gonna say something very briefly about the study. I'm assuming that most people in this audience already know about it. And then I wanna add um, some ways to think about it. So I wanna remind you that the 623 men in the study, all African-Americans in Macon County, were enrolled by the Public Health Service with the assistance of the medical and nursing personnel at Tuskegee University in what they thought was a treatment plan for what was called the bad blood. Uh, and it meant that most of the men were supposed to be, not all of them were, in the late non-contagious stage of the disease called syphilis. 
About two thirds of the men had the disease, the other third were non-syphilitic controls. They were told they provided aspirins, iron tonics and vitamins were treatment, and that even a diagnostic spinal tap was special treatment. They were denied the drugs for treatment beginning in the 1930s, and then again by the late 40s, early 50s, when penicillin became the drug of choice for the disease. Instead, I want to argue that they wandered in what we can now think of as a medical desert for 40 years, almost biblical in that sense, between 1932 and 72, never knowing what they had. Many died from the disease or could have passed it on to their sexual partners, wives, and children. The study, I think, and this is important, was premised on a medical misunderstanding, but was at that time an understanding that the disease was different in blacks and whites, the assumption that the cardiovascular complications happened in African Americans, the neurological ones in whites, when the evidence, of course, did not even show this. More than a dozen research studies in medical journals showed that those left untreated became sicker and died earlier, but some of these reports actually called the men volunteers, which obscured somewhat the fact that they had never been asked if they wanted to participate, but the study itself was never hidden away. One of the things that's really interesting to think about here is that none of the evolving rules after the Nuremberg trials after World War II, which denounced the Nazi medical experiments, were seen as applying to the work in Macon County. Because of course, it, the thought idea was that in Germany, this was being done by either barbarians or Nazis. The public health service doctors instead thought they were fighting in a war against syphilis. And as generals in the war, um, they had the right to determine who should live or die in this battle. Therefore, I think it's important to remember morally that it's too easy to assure ourselves that this will never happen again, given new rules for research and our knowledge of the past. But it fails to understand that kind of position, that racism is embedded in medical understandings that guide research then and still do with today's medicine. Just look at the research that's done now on the way in which the algorithms in spirometers, um, the assumptions about drug amounts on pain tolerance all have a racist component that assumes that race is a biological category that determines these um, how we should think about medicine and how we should provide it. It is too easy, I think, especially for those of us in the medical field, to think of the doctors who perpetuated the study as racist barbarians from another time and place since the study ended 50 years ago. But I need, to, need us to really imagine and to think about why the researchers thought they had the right to do this study and how caught up they were in the importance of their research that they didn't see the human beings in front of them. Finally, I think it's important to consider how beliefs, correct and imaginary of what happened in the study continue to circulate in our society. And when coupled to everyday racism experiences leads people of color to both mistrust, um, uh, to mistrust medical um, uh, options and the medical profession in general and the medical institutions. But the key point as we're talking about is where the blame should be put. And we need to think about how we make these institutions more trustworthy rather than to think about the concept of mistrust. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, we're now going to move to the two substantive uh, 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 issues Today, HIV AIDS and then maternal infant mortality. So we have Jesse Milan uh, to offer some reflections as someone who's devoted much of his life uh, to the uh, work of uh, trying to address HIV AIDS in this country, particularly, but not only among Black Americans. So Jesse. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Farrow, and thank you to Tuskegee and your Center for Bio Bioethics for inviting me. I'm Jesse Milan, and I'm the president and CEO at AIDS United. And AIDS United is a national organization focused on ending the HIV epidemic in the United States. And I come to this work as the CEO of AIDS United as a person who's been living with HIV for 40 years. Last year was my 40th year since I acquired the HIV virus. 
And over these years, as a lawyer, as a community activist, as a public health official, I found that HIV is very much emblematic of the issues that are causing us to have this very webinar today. Health disparities continue, and HIV AIDS is probably one of the best examples of where racial health disparities exist. Today, there are 1.2 million people living with HIV in the United States. Many of us are now age 50 and over, and that's a wonderful thing. Half of the people living with HIV in the U.S. today are now age 50 and over. But here's the problem. Of the 1.2 million people living with HIV who have acquired HIV, nearly half are African American. Why is that? Why is that when African Americans are barely 12 or 13% of the U.S. population? That disparity is a problem. There's another 1.2 million people in the United States that the CDC tells us are highly vulnerable to acquiring HIV. And the vast majority of those are black and brown people, especially gay men of color. Why is that? And that disparity, those disparities are really the nature of the problem of moral determinants of public health and the lack of true bioethics in our approach to health care and health research. And one critical example is this. Of the 1.2 million of us who are living with HIV in the United States, many of us who are aging with HIV healthy are doing so because we have achieved an un, a, a suppressed viral load, meaning that our by being on medications, the virus is contained, it is not spreading and destroying our immune system so that we acquire an HIV, an AIDS-defining illness and die. It's called viral suppression. Barely half of us living with HIV have achieved viral suppression. And I was so struck in that earlier uh, section on the uh, study on syphilis at Tuskegee that we thought of the problem that these men were untreated, untreated. Look at the number of people in the United States living with HIV who are not getting the treatment they need because barely half of us are achieving viral suppression. That's on the clinical side. The other half on the prevention side is that there is a wonderful drug called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, that can literally stop for 100% someone from acquiring the HIV virus. The percentage of people who are African American who are who are actually aware of PrEP and accessing PrEP, barely 25% of the people who are currently on PrEP are black or brown people. That's a problem. And so when we think about moral determinants of health and bioethics, I think we have to go straight to what does the HIV epidemic give us an example of where morality did not exist. And that is this, we have animus, we have disparagement, and we have moral judgments that have been applied to people who are at risk for HIV and living with HIV since the very beginning. But other words for animus, disparagement, and moral judgments are these, racism, homophobia, sexism, misogyny, transphobia, those can easily be applied and are all the time to people who are vulnerable to HIV and living with HIV. And these words reinforce the stigma of HIV that prevents so many of us from even getting into care or even wanting to know our status. These problems are what we face every day. I hear stories, I met a man not long ago, at a, at a conference for, sponsored by the Congressional Black Caucus, a heterosexual Black man who had had HIV for over 20 years, he learned his status when he was discharged from the Army. Over 20 years and never told anybody, including his own family. That's how deep the stigma of HIV can be because of animus, disparagement and, and moral judgments that lead to homophobia, sexism, transphobia, misogyny, on and on. 
And so when I think about what is needed for achieving greater ethics in our research and our approach to HIV AIDS, I go back to the very beginning of the epidemic, when in 1982, a group of men stormed what was then known as the Lesbian and Gay Health Conference. They stormed it and said, we have to talk talk about HIV AIDS, and you cannot talk about it without talking to us. They were gay men living with HIV. And from that movement, which and that event happened in Denver, came the Denver Principles, which are now known as meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS, or the MEPA Principles, meaningful involvement of people living with or vulnerable to HIV and AIDS. What do we need to do in research and clinical care to assure that we have meaningful involvement of the people who are impacted by a disease? That role is for us to think about in this very session. What does meaningful involvement look like in research? What does meaningful involvement look like in clinical care? Now, I have been in a clinical trial. I was in a clinical trial for 10 years. And I got a sense that my role in that trial was because of all the many demographics that I have as a Black man. But I've also been on the other side. I've been on the deciding side when I've been a grant reviewer many, many times for multi, multi million dollar grants from the federal government on HIV research. And when I look at that research, I wonder, well, how is the community that's impacted by this disease actually being involved? Well, we see community advisory boards. But is that tokenism or is that meaningful involvement? Maybe we have some ideas that we should be thinking about in a different way when it comes to what does meaningful involvement in clinical research really look like? What if we had a community principal investigator? What if we had community members who are actually co-authors of the research? And I think that leads me to the final question that I want to raise, which we have heard from that wonderful statement from that um, survivor of the Tuskegee the study at Tuskegee, that it is never too late to create trust. Trust is built when we can trust the messengers who bring important messages to us. What do we need to create trust? Is it merely the message itself or is it also the messenger? I need to know that I can trust who I'm hearing the message from, and that I can become a trusted messenger as well. Creating that trust might very well mean that we start with meaningful involvement and that we break down the structures that have created so much mistrust, so much disparagement, so much animus, so much hatred, and so much injustice. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so much to let digest, but um, I'm going to move over to um, Wang Li uh, and actually uh, uh, help me and everybody make sure we're pronouncing your name right. Uh, names matter too. Of course. So thank you for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wangoi Moi Gai, a professor at Brandeis University and a historian of race and medicine. My work examines the, the long history of Black infant death in this country, and this is one of the most enduring racial disparities, an issue that raises serious questions about the ethics of trust, as Jesse just raised, and also the ethics of blame and responsibility, especially when it comes to questions like who is responsible for protecting the vulnerable and which lives are viewed as worth saving. And in the past few years, there has been a growing public conversation and policy attention to racial disparities in maternal and infant health. As we heard earlier, just this past weekend, the New York Times reported on a recent study looking at how race and class impacts birth outcomes. And the researchers there were analyzing data available in California and found that regardless of income level, Black families are at greater risk of dying or experiencing 
significant birth complications. And this is just one of many, many studies and reports documenting worse and in some instances worsening childbirth outcomes among Black Americans, including higher rates of maternal deaths, stillbirths, infant deaths, and severe morbidity. And much of this media coverage has described the situation as a crisis. And that, that language of crisis has proven effective in generating a national conversation, in catalyzing political advocacy. Yet at the same time, it obscures the fact that the losses we are experiencing, that we are reading about today are not new. They are the result of processes and, and practices that have been hundreds of years in the making and have worked to cut Black lives short. Now, alongside this media coverage, we're also witnessing new policies that aim to address these longstanding disparities. And we can look, for example, to the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, this legislative package spearheaded by Congresswoman Alma Adams from North Carolina and Lauren Underwood in Illinois. And for both of these Black women U.S. representatives, their concerns about Black maternal health grew out of their lived experiences. It wasn't just about the statistics that motivated them to act. For Congresswoman Adams, the issue cut close to home in that her daughter Janelle nearly died while giving birth. And for Representative Underwood, she spent over a decade working as a nurse and understands the impact nurses have on patient care, including on childbirth outcomes. And I mentioned their legislative efforts, their work in government, because it's an example of how Black community leaders, especially Black women advocates, have been long engaged in calling out the injustices and marshalling resources to protect the lives and livelihoods of Black mothers and children. And if we want to deepen the conversation about Black maternal and infant health in the U.S., and if we want to do better at making childbirth safer for everyone, then we have to look to and learn from the work of Black women health activists who for centuries have drawn attention to the ways in which their families and their communities bear a heavier burden of premature death. Black women have been on the ground providing respectful, holistic care, forging ways to prevent these deaths from happening. We can trace this model of care back to the work of enslaved midwives, and the reasons why Black families trusted midwives to see them through pregnancy, through labor, through the earliest fragile moments of a newborn's life. We can also look to the work of figures like Dr. Rebecca Crumpler, the first Black woman in the country to earn a medical degree in 1864. And Dr. Crumpler, she dedicated her career to Black maternal and infant health. It included her traveling to communities across North America to provide medical aid including among newly freed slaves. She opened her home to give poor families a safe place where they could go for free childcare and free health care. And Dr. Pumpler also took the additional step of publishing her health advice so that women could have a trusted resource to turn to when their babies became sick. And that guide titled A Book of Medical Discourses was very likely the first health advice book written by an African-American. And in it, Crumpler challenged arguments that Black people were inherently more susceptible to premature death. She did so by naming the larger conditions that made Black parents more vulnerable to losing a baby, conditions rooted in racism, in sexism, in society's indifference to the needs of the poor. And in this regard, Crumpler's efforts to bring needed healthcare resources, her work to educate her community, and the work she also did to challenge these theories of biological racism are all representative of the ways Black women especially have never been silent, but have spoken back to the injustices that they face, the ways in which they've organized to tackle a health inequity that for too long has been rationalized as natural, as inevitable, or the fault of individual mothers rather than a tragic reflection of an unequal and inequitable healthcare system. And I bring this historical perspective into the conversation because as we're working to reframe and transform the way we talk about race and healthcare and medical research, 
to address enduring problems like the HIV AIDS epidemic, like maternal infant mortality, it's important that we recover and attend to the long and rich tradition of Black communities and Black activists organizing for health, for better health care, in the face of institutional racism, in the face of government neglect, to understand what these earlier generations of activists did, the obstacles they faced, and what we can learn from their struggles to ensure the survival of the youngest, of the most vulnerable. They've really left behind a rich legacy of work and ideas that reflect a deep commitment to health and racial justice that I, I believe we just can't over, we can't afford to overlook if we stand any chance of achieving birth equity. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, we now have uh, brief comments from our two commentators, uh, but I am going to just add, um, uh, uh, I put in the uh, chat uh, a long tweet thread I put in earlier this week, uh, week um, about uh, moral determinants, stigma, HIV, AIDS, and how powerful um, uh, it was in improving things when people like Tony Fauci and others initially were forced to listen to the activists and then having learned things, uh, said how much they'd learned from them. And I expressed at the end uh, the hope that uh, we might uh, 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 start listening to Black women um, who have been telling us for decades, if not centuries. Um, uh, and then after I'd uh, done that, uh, like, why has that not happened? And I think you cannot talk about the um, lessons from history from the HIV AIDS ad advocates and the differences in the way that Black women have not been listened to without understanding the differences between the way voices of men and voices of women, especially who are Black in this country, are listened to. And until we address that moral determinant, we're going to have continued uh, ongoing serious problems. Um, so. Uh, uh, Termika uh, Smith, uh, I invited uh, uh, Termika to talk personally or from CDC, but just what thoughts has this conversation so far sparked for you? Sure. Thank you so much um, for the invitation. Um, I'm not trying to necessarily review the ethical shortcomings of the USPHS study or the lagging change around Black maternal mortality and what so often seems is a lack of care for those living with HIV or AIDS. Um, those have been laid out so eloquently in both the historical backgrounds provided by Susan, Jesse, and, um, and Wang, Wang Koi. What I would like to bring back to the forefront and reiterate is something that was brought up earlier on um, and the importance of the concept kind of posed um, about joint venture or joint adventure, similarly to what Jesse noted um, around MEPA. Um, it has distinct similarities to the nothing about us without us principle. And in this case, I'm invoking this in regard to all traditionally marginalized communities. I think we can all agree that any research protocol, uh, research investigations, or policy developed should always include full and direct participation of members of the group or groups affected. And this has not often been the case for a lot of research, including that of the federal government. Um, but, you know, we live and we learn and we learn as we work. Um, and, and it's important that we remain active and solutions forward to ensure this does not continue to happen. Um, in that vein, the next question that must be asked is how? How can we do that? Um, the first thing is supporting traditionally marginalized communities in becoming the researcher and provider. An example of this can be through grassroots efforts focused on what I'm gonna call real community-based participatory research. Um, another opportunity includes supporting more scientific pipelines that provide young students of color, not only the exposure, but the tools to become those future scientists who will be doing the principal investigation um, in this important work. And lastly, calling out studies and creating accountability for studies, study proposals that do not include those being affected. If researchers and policy wonks like us who care about this work do not continually note the importance of community inclusion, who is actually gonna be able to do that? 
Ethics in public health is central um, to the vision of CDC, particularly around equ equitably protecting health, safety, and security. And as public health professionals, um, it is woven into our DNA to always keep ethical principles and values at the forefront when discussing new policies and actions for every decision. I can say that CDC strives to consistently integrate the tools of ethical analysis in its day-to-day operations, including providing consults, education, training, and opportunities. Um, there is a public health et code of ethics, thank God, a promise to society a commitment to hold a moral and ethical compass to the work we do in pursuing public health, a true commitment as we seek to support the highest possible health for the public. We in the health focused community, that's all of us, must always keep in mind that public health decisions affect the health and well-being of people, groups, and communities. And I will say one more thing about CDC specifically. Um, we know that we should always be forging towards better inclusion. That is both at the workforce level, ensuring we have scientists of color, and at the program and research implementation, research and implementation level, where we must include communities. We are working to better engage with the communities we aim to serve throughout the entire process of public health activities, from deciding together what questions to ask to finding out how best to broadly share so that community members can use the results. And that is key. This work is not easy in the face of historical and institutional injustices that we are very well aware of. Ensuring that CDC studies meet the highest ethical standards and that CDC programs carefully address health disparities are not destinations, but processes that require humility and a constant focus on ethics and equity in all that we do. Our trustworthiness in the eyes of the public is the true measure of our efforts and of our progress and we remain steadfast in that. And one last thing I do wanna say is those are my opinions <laughs> and my opinions alone and not those of specifically the CDC. I do have to do that. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, we have uh, questions from the audience, but I was uh, hoping that for a little while we could actually have the four people that we just had. Um, uh, interacting and talking together uh, with each other. Uh, there, some of the questions from the um, that have come into us. I'm going to put two together. Um, uh, Termika, you re you talked about real part community based participatory research, um, uh, and uh, one of the questions as I've been thinking about this is uh, if uh, we really took Paul Ramsey seriously and joint adventure, or even further. Uh, realized researchers are guests in the community and thought back uh, uh, to the 1932. And if the scientists had in Macon County found rates of syphilis and then asked the people in Macon County, what would they like to understand better? Uh, I suspect they would have wanted to understand how to eradicate syphilis. They would have had ideas. They would have come been partners. So it's not just inviting community members to participate in our studies. It would be actually turning the world, I would say, right side up and going into communities and saying, what do you need to understand better in order to achieve the health that we've heard Black midwives and their patients have done for a long time? So question for uh, uh, any of uh, you, and you can raise your hand, is connecting to a different question in the chat, which is um, bioethics historically seems not to have much impact on this. What would it look like in the future? to say bioethics has, the question was one, like the fights we're trying to fight, but, but what would be happening uh, and how with AIDS or maternal infant mortality, if we took what we've talked about so far um, and we're putting into action? Um, Jesse or Wanga, you wanna go, who wants to go first? What would real community participation in research mean? And what would it look like to say we've been achieving victories? Yes. Susan, why don't you go first? <laughs> sure. Yes, Susan? 
I'm, I'm, I'm unmuting. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I think these that the rhetoric is good, but the, the reality of how you do this is actually quite complicated. And we have to be really mindful of that. So um, in the 90s, I served as the consumer representative on the OBGYN devices panel of the FDA. And um, I didn't have a vote, but I um, I had moral suasion, essentially. But I was supposed to re represent all of womankind, right, on, and how we evaluated these um, things. And I think what's really was hard is, you know, I'm a historian. I don't have an MPH. I'm not, I only play a doctor and nurse in my classroom. I'm not, you know, I don't have that kind of training. And it was very difficult sometimes to think about how to get a word in edgewise, how so much of what I was talking about made no sense to the doctors um, at all. And I just thought there should have been, um, you know, more training, not just for me, but for the other people on the committee to think about how to respond to the to, to me as the so-called so consumer representative um, in that situation. But FDA required that on its advisory committee. So one of the policy questions to raise is, what would it look like if federal dollars required community representatives? But just putting the body on the committee is irrelevant. I mean, just like we know that black policemen kill people in Memphis, right? So it's not just about the bodies. It's about how they, what they think about, what's in their heads, um, what they think is the right thing to do. So I think we need the training both for the community people, but also for the so-called experts who are on those committees themselves. I, I would really echo what Susan is saying. I mean, as I said in, earlier, I've been a, involved as a as a participant in clinical trials, but I have also been a reviewer a lot, especially in these last few years. And the burden on the one community representative, the burden of the one patient representative to stand up to all the scientists on a review panel to determine whether uh, something's going to get funded or not is huge. But the role that we play on community advisory boards, I'm beginning to think is more and more just tokenism because I've been in too many grant reviews where the application describes all of the clinical research and this much is literally one paragraph is de is de devoted to what's going to be the community's role in hearing about the research but not really influencing the research and i you know i during covid i actually met a dear colleague of mine who was in a clinical trial for one of the covid vaccines I was like, oh my God, I don't know that I've ever talked to anybody who's been part of a clinical trial recently who's willing to say it out loud. The transparency about clinical research does not exist. And yet if I knew that there were people like me really involved in the work, or if people like me shared that the experience of being in a clinical trial was a valuable experience, that might change the trajectory of who's participating and who uses the outcome of the research. That secrecy needs to stop. And that secrecy is what I think is holding so many of us back from even understanding why a clinic participating in a clinical trial is important or that the outcomes of clinical trials really should apply to us. So let me take that. Let me take that uh, a little bit further. I mean, this is the um, uh, you know comes up in, in Massachusetts over and over. People are very proud. We're going to invite people to the table, like so they can sit at the table. But it's say whose table is it? If it's government, um, uh, the the people bought the pay, uh, table, paid for the table, owned the table. Uh, these conversations. I've been in a hospital almost all of my life. When we we're very proud that we have a couple people from the community sit and join in a meeting. Um, if it really was community community centered, why aren't all the meetings in the community, and the majority of the people are there, and then the researchers are the one or two or three who are there. Um, and even if it's in the hospital, the hospital I, in the hospital felt like, oh, we've got all this money, and we're being generous when we have people in the community come in, not charging them. Why aren't we paying for them? for all of their time, since every one of us gets paid for our time? Um, and why are we admitting that every single building that we have, except for philanthropy, was paid for by their health insurance premiums, their tax dollars, they should own the buildings. I mean, I just think once I start thinking down this road, there's a lot that would change very, very quickly. So having said and that, uh, I wanna hear from Dr. David Hodge 
um, who's joined us now from the National Center, Associate Director of the National Center of Bioethics. Um, what do you make of all this? And as you are thinking about the future work of the National Center, what thoughts come to mind for you? Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. I'm so happy to see everyone on here today. Uh, Mama, Mama said that I should always say thank you. So I need to say thank you to specific people. Um, Dr. Ruben Warren, who retired in, in, in December, was instrumental in pulling in part of this team, this, this Tuskegee Harvard collaboration. So I just want to say express thanks to Dr. Ruben Warren. He's the one who brought me to Tuskegee. He mentored me in public health and kind of got me started on this trajectory. Dr. Reagan Zero, who's my uh, my, my, my father in this world, my mentor, who is very important and has done so much research in the, the syphilis study, the so-called syphilis study. Um, um, Dr. Bob Trug, who is the director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard, and Dr. Rebecca Brendel Weintraub, and Christine Mitchell, and Lachlan, my big brother, and of course, my dear sister, Susan, who I was able to spend some time with and a dear husband, and Jesse, who's like a brother to me now that I'm getting to know him after our, our November session. This is a family affair. And that, that the notion of family and relationship is extremely important to the conversations that we are having. Jesus said something about love your neighbor as yourself until we start to see ourselves in our neighbors and relationships and have, me, have them to be meaningful and understanding of community being meaningful, we, we're gonna continue to kind of wander. I teach um, bioethics classes and I'm forging and thinking through the notion of black bioethics and what that means because students always ask the question, I'm sure each of us who teach ethics, uh, Tamika um, asked the question, um, is there anything good that comes out of the syphilis, the so-called syphilis study, the United States Public Health Service a study of untreated Negro men in, 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 in Macon County? Is there anything good that comes out of it? And we often say stuff like, well, informed consent came out of it, that's good. The IRB came out of it, that's good. But I think that other good is coming out of it. If we look at this thing consequentially, that the study, it's the so-called study itself was not good, but what emerged was an opportunity to access conversations that we may not have necessarily put together. Having Jesse here talking about HIV and AIDS, having one guy talking about maternal mortality and infant mortality, and Sheila um, Neil Shaw talking about maternal mortality, gun violence, these kinds of conversations. These are the kinds of things that Carmen, your grandfather, his life had meaning in what is happening today. Lachlan began the conversation talking about bioethics by defining bio as life, ethics as values or the rightness and wrongness of things. And I think to some degree, bioethics mainstream has become so uh, scientific, has become so, um, so focused on um, things that really matter that we, be, we may be missing lives that matter. Imagine that in the, converse, in the mainstream conversation bioethics, that homelessness is not a major conversation. When you take a look at a homeless person, um, what each person who's living on the street is battling with something besides the homelessness and besides the weather. Many of them are battling with HIV and AIDS. So now they have these comorbidities that they're struggling with. And if these are not bioethical issues, then what are? Now, they're bad with I'm mental here. health. That's great. I, I'm, I, uh, two examples that that sparks. My, my brother, David, um, uh, uh, a hero to many people, almost every young person in global health is Dr. Paul Farmer. Um, Tracy Kidder uh, wrote a book about him, Mountains Beyond Mountains. Tracy Kidder's latest book um, is about rough sleepers, about one of my closest friends for decades, Dr. Jim O'Connell, leader of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And it's really striking to me 
about the incredible impact of Paul Farmer and Partners in Health and Jim O'Connell and Boston Healthcare for the Homeless is both organizations from the beginning. Uh, Paul started with people in Haiti, asked them, what do you want? What do you know? Found that they knew more. They actually knew more of practical value about uh, how to control HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis. Paul knew the biology and medications um, and in everything they've done in Haiti, which accomplished better cure or better control rates for AIDS than we'd ever done in Boston. Um, it was because it started from the wisdom, the knowledge that the people there had. Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, Jim O'Connell, when he first started working with him 40 years ago, um, uh, they didn't want him to do anything starting off except wash feet and all that. Like they get to know them. Everything that they've done, the people who are or have been homeless are on the board of directors. They decide everything. And they're the most effective organization working with the homeless because um, it's not just the people who are homeless or the people in Haiti or now people in Rwanda have a moral right. They actually know more than anybody else about what works in their lives, how to make that work and all of that. So this is not just touchy-feely moral, oh, we should involve them. Uh, Paul Farmer and Partners in Health, Jim O'Connell, Boston Healthcare for Homeless have proved that if all you care about is concrete results, this is the way you get it. Um, we're getting just about to the end. So I'm gonna invite before I turn over to uh, Carmen for some closing words and then a, a three minute video from Tuskegee. Um, that we'll all enjoy. Um, but uh, I'll start with uh, David. Before we get to that, can we go back to the everybody on the screen? Um, uh, 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 I'll go back in reverse order. One thing, uh, uh, idea that you have, especially for the students who have joined us, young people, about um, what they should take from this and maybe do or think about doing. So David first. Yes. Um, well, subjects are humans and humans are our neighbors. Jesse? One thing. Ask the question, what do you need for this work to be meaningful for you? Great. Wangui? One thing. I think behind, Behind all of these statistics that we look at, that we recite, that we recount, are our people, our individual lives that are still living, that we've lost. And those are, that should be at the center of our attention and the center of our concern, not the numbers, not sort of thinking about it abstractly and aggregately. Tramika. Health disparities weaken our entire society by diminishing the human potential of millions of people in this country. So keeping that in mind in all the work that you do um, and keeping that at the forefront of, of, of your life's work. Susan, you're mute. You're on mute. Sorry, I um, I think we have to think about the difference between community participation and community control, and they're not the same thing. We don't need more tokenism. We need to really rethink how we structure research and medical care. Great. Okay, Carmen, you have two or three minutes for some closing words before we go to the video. Great. Thanks about you. all of this. Actually, one thing. First, I'll put you in spot. One thing and then mm -hmm. offer some closing reflections, channeling your mom, your grandfather for all of us. Sure. Um, I would like to, again, acknowledge another important quote by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King as my, my words or my, my short um, piece. Um, and that's of all of the forms of inequality and injustice in healthcare. Well, I should say of all of the forms of inequality Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, and he said that decades ago, and here we are still in this space, um, having the same struggle with health inequities. Um, there is a very popular book out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's called The Political Determinants of Health that was written by um, Daniel E. Dawes. Um, it's an awesome book if you haven't had a chance to pick one up and read it, I, I suggest you do. But in thinking about this um, conversation today, I'm also thinking about our 
our, the, the title of our talk, which is the moral determinants of health and how that moral lens really has to be a part of this conversation as does community involvement. Um, Jesse, I also served as a voting member of an institutional review board for uh, MedStar for many years um, and did that really out of obligation and, and as devotion and, and thinking about my grandfather and his participation and sort of my approach was to look at the protocol against the informed consent to see how, how much was shared in the informed consent that was in the protocol. And oftentimes it didn't always match. Um, so I, I commend you for doing that. Um, I think it's really very important work that more people should, should do as community and voting members. Um, I'd also like to quickly acknowledge um, an important um, partner and, and group that we've been working with, and that is the Millbank Memorial Fund. Um, we had a wonderful um, um, event last June. Um, the Millbank Memorial Fund was actually engaged and involved in the study by paying for the autopsies of the men um, um, that were um, subjects in the study. And uh, just recently, we've come to know the Millbank Memorial Fund and they provided a large gift to the Voices for Our Fathers Foundation, um, a $2 million gift as restitution. And we're really hoping that our partnership with them will continue to grow and allow us to be engaged partners in um, addressing the moral compass um, and promoting health equity and ensuring as Dr. Reverby says, that this really doesn't happen again and whether there's a potential for it to happen again. Um, so I thank you all for being um, engaged. I thank all of the audience members for, for listening in and asking questions. Our website is www.voicesforfathers.org and we certainly welcome partnership. Um, we, we welcome involvement and in any questions that you may have of us. So thank you so much for this time this afternoon. Thank you, Carmen. Um, so let's go to the video.
Carmen. Thank you everyone for joining us. We look forward to continuing this series and in continuing this dialogue, uh, we wish you a very wonderful day. Thank you.